بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد والذين آمنوا واتبعتهم ذريتهم بإيمان الحقنا بهم ذريتهم وما ألتناهم من عملهم من شيء كل امرئ بما كسب رهين صدق الله العظيم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كلكم راء وكلكم مسؤول عن رعيته الإمام راء والمسؤول عن رعيته والرجل راع في أهله وهو مسؤول عن رعيته والمرأة راعية في بيت زوجها ومسؤولة عن رعيتها أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم I'm just trying to think back I was here about two years ago or something like that two and a half years ago was it one and a half years ago what did I speak about then? Is it about marriage? It's about marriage, right? So hopefully everybody's married by now, since we spoke about marriage last time. And you've either had a child or you're having children. So let's talk about bringing up children then. Is that all right? Because you just said blessings upon blessings. And I was trying to analyze what blessings upon blessings we're discussing. So marriage is a blessing and children are a blessing. So I thought that would come under the topic because when I like to speak about the topic that is mentioned on the poster. I don't know who made that topic up, but somebody might have come very far just for that topic. So, or did you guys have something else in mind when you saw blessings upon blessings? Okay, if there's no protest, then it's fine. We'll... So we have little children here, mashallah. So inshallah, this will, will make this about children. So this is dedicated to the children, is that all right? It's a bayan for you today. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So one of the most difficult things that we face is having children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this process, <clears throat> has made this process through which the ummah continues. And the Prophet sallallahu encouraged the increase of the ummah by saying, uh, marry fertile women, loving and fertile women, tazawwajul walud al wadud. Because the Prophet sallallahu wants to uh, be able to boast about this on the day of judgment that he's got a huge ummah. So part of the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us is that we um, procreate and mashallah bring children up in the world and then these children become older so we need more children so that's why uh, children will be ongoing. However, one of the most difficult things is to bring up children and it's in this century it's become even more difficult. So a few things, if we had a proper Islamic community, a proper Islamic community environment 100% Islamic where essentially everybody was praying Salat in the Masjid at least the men were praying Salat in the Masjid everything was halal uh, there was no haram possibility there was no exposure nothing of that nature then a child growing in that area in that kind of uh, place would usually there won't be that many challenges there'd be the human challenges of greed and uh, human challenges of laziness and all of these other things but otherwise the only ethos the only way to do things would be islamic but where is that community maybe that community existed to a certain degree in medina munawwara in the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam however that 100 percent islamic community doesn't i don't think so it doesn't exist on a large scale right however we have muslim communities so we have muslim communities in india and in pakistan and in afghanistan and in bangladesh and Sri Lanka, and where else? I don't want to miss anybody out. Somalia. You're from Somalia? Okay. Anywhere else? G? Indonesia. Mashallah. Indonesia. You're not from Indonesia. 
Yeah. Anyway, so we don't want to mention all the countries of the world, but what I'm trying to say is that these are all Muslim, Muslim things. The issue is, is that none of these are 100% Islamic. Plus, the, uh, the whole world has become globalized, right? The whole world has become globalized. So, uh, basically, whether it's a Western country or otherwise, we're all uh, in different challenges, right? Now, traditionally speaking, if we take, um, how old is he? He's five and a half. Now, everything he knows so far, right? Five and a half. And how old are you? You are 11. Every, uh, your name is uh, Urwa, right? So everything Urwa knows until now, 11 years old, where did he learn it from? Think of all of the possible sources of knowledge where Urwa knows everything that he knows now. Where did he get it from? One was the home. It better be, right? One was the home. What else? The school. School, madrasa, we'll put all of that together. So educational facilities. Number three. The, essentially, when you say friends, neighbors, uh, billboards outside, um, what you might interact with in the park, what you see outside, and so on. That's the social outside in the real life. And that were, they were the three sources of knowledge, sources of um, tarbiyah, sources of learning for all of our children. So for thousands of years, since Adam Salam's time to this time, essentially it was in some way or uh, in some form or other, those were the three places. But we are so, so fortunate and lucky that in the last 20 years or so, we have a fourth source of knowledge. What is the fourth source of knowledge for our children now? G? Yes, exactly. The social media. And none of our predecessors had that. We're the lucky ones, mashallah. Right. Only we get that. So those are four places. Now, out of these four sources, which is the most important? The home, because that has to be the filter. So now that we're in agreement that the home is the most important of these, uh, of these sources of knowledge, how should the home be for this? Because ultimately the buck stops with us as parents, and that's the home, right? That's the only one we have full control over. We don't have full control over schools or even madrasa sometimes. Society, definitely not. And the social media, ya Allah, you know, that, that's, that's very, very difficult. So the home. So that means the home has to be the main environment. The home has to be the filter. Right, this is very important. So everything, everywhere else, it has to ultimately come back home and be filtered. So the home has to be a filter. Have you ever thought about the home being a filter? Right, we may not have exactly thought of it in those words, but a lot of concerned parents, they know that is it. The home is the filter. So today we want to speak about how the home can become the best filter and what kind of strategies we can try to use, inshallah. Now there are so many variables in this discussion that I can't possibly speak about until Aisha, I can't possibly cover all of these things. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover several important points just to get our mind going about this, to have the concern and some ideas. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions uh, related to this topic. And then we can take those, inshallah, make it even more uh, relevant, inshallah. So now the first thing is that these environments have to be uh, the filter and the most important. So everything you learn outside, that the children are picking up outside, somehow at the home it needs to be cleared. It needs to be either confirmed, rejected, corrected, and, and so on. So how do you do that? Now we have different types of children. Some children, right, and mashallah, we have quite a few children here. Which children are open book and which children are closed book? The open book ones are a bit easier to deal with because you know exactly what they're thinking. They babble everything out. Right? Sometimes a bit too much that they keep going on about stuff, but alhamdulillah, at least you know what's going on inside. Right? It's transparent. So you can catch things sooner. Oh, my friend said this. Oh, what did he say? You know? The closed book ones are the most difficult. Allahu Akbar. What is going on inside? What is brewing inside? What sadness or, uh, or happiness for, uh, or, or, or confusion is going on outside? And uh, from the cases that we do in Allah, for, you know, God forbid, it's too late by the time you find out something. Before it comes to the surface, it's too late. So what do we do about that? 
we, we're not going to assume the worst, but we just have to be careful. So I'll come back to that topic of what to do there. But that, that, that is now the home environment needs to be made a very, very comfortable environment, a very open environment, an enjoyable environment, uh, along with being an Islamic environment. Right? That's sometimes very difficult to do. There's some extremes in this regard. Some people are just too liberal and they think it's all okay. And some people are a bit just too strict. I had a question from this mother. She said, my son or daughter is nearly finished their hips and they're asking for a party. They're asking for a party. I was like, what? What's wrong with that? Right? Um, we don't do this kind of stuff. Right? And I said, well, where? And they said that I've got a sister-in-law. She's an alima and a brother-in-law. He's an alim and their children do this. So you're learning it from there. But that's not really... And they're not like Salafi, so it's not like about whether it's established in the Quran or Sunnah. It's not one of those issues. It's just a bit of dryness, I think. Now, in the most polite way, I had to try to explain. And I said, look, there's nothing wrong with that, Kushime. If you've got the capability, because you don't have the capability to know. But, you know, you have, uh, the children are, have so many other celebrations. And isn't this something to celebrate that they've memorized the entire Quran? The speech of Allah, they've memorized it at this young age. Isn't that something to celebrate? You should probably feed the whole town, to be honest. It's just, mashallah, in Toronto and in London, you know, we have Huffaz khatams every day that has become so normal that people like Bijo Khatam, right? It's really, I've been to one country in Europe, which has been Muslim for several hundred years, and there's 20 to 25% Muslim population there. And they only have three Hufas in the whole country right now. Uh, well, they only have three Hufas in the whole country about three years ago. And they've been Muslim for longer than we have in the other parts of the West. Because they went through some major uh, indoctrination and so on. So, alhamdulillah, now they have a, this is Montenegro, they have a, they have a Hivs madrasa that just started up. They, in the whole country, there was no uh, full Quran Taraweeh. And here, you don't even find space. You have to do it in homes, right? Alhamdulillah. That's something to celebrate. It's something to celebrate. So I try to explain that, that, look, we have to have these kind of celebrations. So sometimes you have that kind of an issue. So we have to be strict, but it has to be open that they can come. And... Now, there's another test that we can do. If our teenagers would rather be outside somewhere with their friends or wherever, rather than being in the house. Now, it's okay. They need to be doing something with somebody. You know with some good people but if they want to be there most of the time and they don't want to be in the home that's an issue right that means that they just don't find enjoyment in the house the other extreme of that is they want to be inside the house they don't want to go anywhere but they want to be in their room closed door with a device not with the family that's a problem as well so those are extremes what do you think which one is worse you think mr ruh why are they both bad? That's worse than being with friends. What about if they're really bad friends? Like they're doing vaping and drugs and stuff like that. Going to clubs and dancing. And... It's both bad, isn't it? Unless they're good friends, I guess. Yeah, if the guy constantly wants to be in Tablighi Jamaat, okay, maybe that's all right. Might still be a problem if he never wants to be home. Why? But you know what I'm saying, right? So how do you make that kind of a balanced environment at home? So one of the things here, right, is the home environment should be open as possible. So the mother and father, or at least one of them, needs to be so open that any child of theirs can come and discuss anything they want with them. They should just feel comfortable that, hey, you know what, they were talking about this at school, and this is what's going on. You know, sometimes it's difficult for both parents to be like that. There are, you do hear in lectures that the father should be like a, like a friend to their children. I don't get that. Right, I'm just going to be clear with you. Have you heard that? That, uh, that um, the father needs to be like a friend to their, right? Is that, well, who's going to be the father then if you're a friend, right? I guess just another way of looking at it. But yeah, you need to be friendly, okay? But don't become like just a friend. 
but, but, but be friendly, but you're still the father. You have to, unless you got them on tarbiyah, they're older now, then you can be friends, inshallah, when they, when they get advanced. But what I'm trying to say is that it should be so open that literally they can come and ask about homosexuality. And we're going to need to know how to discuss it. You know, in a proper way. In a sensible way. In a way that they can then have this discourse outside and not get in trouble. But really be very principled. That means we need to be educated about these things. They should be able to come and speak about, for example, gender, identity, fluidity, dysphoria. They need to discuss all of these things. They need to be able to discuss all of these things. In some families, there's like taboo subjects. For example, let's just say that the family has just uh, done something together, like they've eaten, and then it's Maghrib time, and they couldn't go to the masjid, the men. So now they are going to pray at home. And the mum is not praying. She didn't pray. So the kid goes, why isn't she praying? Mum, why didn't you pray? What do they usually tell her? It's the monthly periods, right? So what, what do they usually tell the children? She prayed, but no, everybody was sitting there. She could not have prayed. She's going to pray later. Well, why didn't she pray with us? You, you, I mean, how long are you going to make those excuses for? And then she's there all the way through. So it's not going to work. So what do people usually say? What's this up? What do they say? She's sick or something, right? Have you heard that one? They say she, she's sick. Now the kid is thinking, she doesn't look sick. She looks completely fine. It could be the older sister. She looks completely fine. She was playing around with us. She's not sick. You're actually encouraging the children might start saying, hey, I'm sick today. I don't want to pray. It's an easy excuse. And then you're calling menstruation a sickness. Are you crazy? Menstruation is not a sickness. That's health. If you don't have it once a month, you know, then that's a sickness. That's possibly... You know, a problem. It's not a sickness. So what are you supposed to do then? Give them the glory de gory details? No. You just have to explain things in a sensible way. So what we do, it's very simple. We just say that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it for women that they're not allowed to pray for certain days of the week after they, re uh, certain days of the month, after they reach a certain age. Do you know that? With uh, Urwa. Women don't have to pray for certain, they're not allowed to actually pray. Even if they wanted to, they're not allowed to pray. That's enough. I mean, I haven't heard a guy, a male yet saying, man, that's discrimination. Why don't we get to do that as well? You know, with all of the rights things and like, that's discrimination. Why is that biased against men? I haven't seen anybody do that yet. Inshallah, they won't. Right? You know what I'm saying? It's just be sensible. With our children, you know, uh, when they're young, we use children language. And that's okay. Instead of dude, we say do do whatever, right? How long are you going to carry on that language for? They have to eventually grow up, right? To make them mature. We've got kids in other countries that are 12 years old and they're uh, managing the father's business. You know, they're the ones selling at the, at the cash point and they won't get conned. They're like really into it. And today we're finding... It's so difficult to get, Ya Allah, to th children to think on the same level or to continue the parents, the father's business. Unless it's an easy business where you just rake in the money and spend it. Then everybody wants to take over that kind of business. It's just time of individualism. We have to bring it all together. So that's why openness is very, very important. Anything, okay. Now what happens is that they might not come and discuss things, so we have to create that environment, but it's our job. I need to know who my children's friends are. I need to be aware. How do I do that? Well, let me invite them home. So, you know, uh, Yusuf, today, uh, I want to, you know, bring your friends home today. Let's have a little party for them. And then you interact with them and you find out what's going on. You have to be aware of that. You have to be aware, uh, I mean, it's going to come up social media. That's going to be the big question here. I don't have an answer for it, right? But we need to know what's going on. I've dealt in the last few years, three, at least three situations where a 16 or 70 year old girl, mostly girls or boys, have lost their faith, faith through social media. They were usually closed books. I was like, didn't you see this coming? I said, no. She wore a hijab all the way through. We just couldn't tell, right? So we need to be aware. 
somehow. In terms of cell phones, push it as late as possible. Push it as late as possible. And then eventually you just, there's no way to escape it though. There's a guy who did not give his daughter a phone and then she got one on the, you know, secretly. And then they found out and then she hid it for about two months and they, they finally got it. And then it was because all of her friends have one and only she didn't. How bad does she feel? So it's a difficult one. So try to push it as much as possible and then just be aware of what's going on. The second, the second point is that when they come, we need to start discussing like, uh, Orwa, does, do you have any friends that vape? No. You just throw in questions and see how they react. Oh, yeah, yeah I do have a friend. His older brother vapes, so he vapes with him. So now you have to bring it in there. You have to preempt questions. Is there anybody that does X, Y, and Z in your class? Have you ever seen anybody doing this in your school? That conversation. So it requires investment to have that kind of conversation. That way at least we're aware, we get alert, alerts about it, and then we can hopefully do something faster than later. A guy just called me, I know him, he's a Maulana. Uh, somebody in his family, he said the father is a bit more strict, the, the, the mother is a bit more liberal in this case, it could be the other way around. And she was okay with her daughter having a phone at the age of, from 13, 14. I think she's, I think 15 now. While the father was against it, but the mother prevailed. And she sent nude pictures to someone at that age. It's kind of like so, unfortunately, becoming quite casual in that sense. To such a degree that once I had a, a woman call me who wants to get married. And the guy she's interested in is asking her to send him nude pictures. Now, what surprised me was why didn't she just say no? She actually called to see that she was saying the right thing. Like, he's asking for that. That's wrong, right? I shouldn't send it. I said, what? are you serious? Like, you're even asking me that question? That means it's so normalized that, alhamdulillah, you still have some consciousness to say, no, that doesn't sound completely right. Let me find out. You know, instead of like, no, man, that's not right. The whole where we are, you know, where, where the, the balance and the moderation and the understanding and the value system is skewed already. Alhamdulillah, she still asks because there's other people, they just do much worse than that before, uh, before tying the knot as such. But it's become normal. It's what, okay, so now what happens is the mother has woken up now. So she took the phone away and must have knocked the daughter a bit. Uh, given her a slap or something. And now the daughter is saying, I'm going to report you if you don't give me my phone back. And now he's asking me what to do. Like, man, I don't have magic. I'm really sorry. It's too late. You give some advice. You do the best you do in that. Sorry, because that's the difficulty that we have in a lot of countries, that the, the legality issues here. You can't do full parenting. It's always prone to these weird threats and th issues. And you have to just tight walk and do the best you can. Okay. Now, uh, to jump ahead, I'm going to give us one idea, one suggestion of how to make tarbiyah easy. This will get us half the job done. In terms of the intensity of the job, half of it will be done if you do one thing. Remember, we can't blame the madrasa, we can't blame the ustad. As many ulama have said, the tarbiyah is the responsibility of the parents. Some have separated it as tarbiyah and ri'ayah. Tarbiyah is the parent responsibility. Ri'ayah, which is just auxiliary, additional kind of uh, attention, is from the ustad. Ultimately, it's the parent's responsibility. So if the ustaz is not playing his role properly, I better change the ustaz or go somewhere else. Because ultimately, I'm going to be questioned. 
Because we're not talking about the ustas today. You know, if I was talking to teachers, I'd be telling them something else, right? Ourselves will say something else, but we're talking to parents here. So you can't outsource this completely, right? Ultimately, it's my responsibility and the home environment we said is the best and the teacher doesn't come home. In the sense that teacher is a separate source. We said that right at the beginning, that the teacher and madrasa is a separate source to the home. The home is the most important environment. It's only in some cases where the home environment is so messed up that sometimes the teachers just about keep it fixed as a secondary role, right? But the primary responsibility of all the concerned parents that are listening today, that's what I'm talking to you. So how do we outsource in such a way that 50% of the job will be done for us, inshallah? Very simple. It's difficult, simple to say, is we outsource it to Allah. How do we outsource it to Allah? The way we outsource it to Allah is that we, div we help our children develop taqwa and consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, very simple to say. What do I mean by that? The simple test is, how old are you, bhai? 15. And you? 16. Okay, that's good. And you're about 14, 20, mashallah. So... 14 and 16, right? Or 15 and 16. Just check our teenagers. By the time they're teenagers, right? If you're not there one day, and it's namaz time, salah time, do they pray? Okay, they might pray late. We sometimes pray late. But do they pray when we're not there? If they pray, even late, that means they're doing it for Allah. Otherwise, they're doing it for us. Very simple test. And if they're doing it for us, then we're not there yet because that's too difficult. How much are you going to go after children 24 7 to make sure they're doing things? Get them connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, a kid from high school, it's his first few days in high school, right? He comes home, second or third day, his mom asked him, Did you pray? Your dhuhr, because dhuhr is in, in school time. By the time you come home, it's asr time, so you can't do asr, uh, dhuhr. Uh, so he said no. Should, he be, should the parents be happy or sad? Happy or sad? So if you put your hands up, if, if, they, if they should be sad that he did not pray, that he said no. Nobody. Okay, that's about 35%, 40% say, how many of you should be happy, think you should be happy? So about five, six of you. So what about the rest of you? What's wrong with you guys? You're happy, sad, you don't know? Huh? Happy? Okay. Why are you guys happy for? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I heard about it. I was so happy. I said, Masha Allah. Because this kid could have easily said, I prayed. Who's going to go and check? In fact, in England, I don't know about here, but in England, if you call up school, did my son pray at school, normal school? They might, they might, uh, report you to a, uh, this organization called Prevent that you are extremists. The kid said, I didn't pray. Okay, why didn't you pray? I couldn't find a place to pray. So now the mom works with him and says, you know what, why don't you find a, go through the corridors and see if there's a teacher's room available that's empty and then maybe just ask nicely your teacher, you know, I need to pray. Can I just spend five minutes? I'll just quickly do my prayer on the side. So, alhamdulillah, since then, the guy's been praying. Another thing that we have done is how much does a normal pair of socks cost? Normal, standard pair of socks. About $2, $3, $5 for you, right, if you get some good ones, right? How much do wudu socks cost? $30 to $40, like 10 times the amount, right? $3 to $30. We've made sure that every one of our children had wudu socks when they go to school. Because, I mean, you don't want to get caught with your foot in the sink. Or the sinks are too dirty. Very complex. So we need to facilitate. So you have to discuss and try to find practical ways to do it. Okay, Orwa, I've got a question for you. Do you, have a, do you have an auntie that's very nice to you, that gives you stuff, that's very loving, that uh, really likes you, an auntie like that. You better because everybody does. You have a color like that, right? 
Right. Now, the next time you go to that Kala's house, does there, you got a Kala like that? Everybody has one. One of the aunties, mashallah, Allah bless our aunties. Right? Anyway, so next time you go to her house, just completely ignore her. Don't meet her. Don't greet her. Don't hug her. And just go to your, your cousin's where he's playing and start playing. How would she feel? She'd feel sad, right? Now, remember, Allah gives us everything. He's given us the parents that we have. He's given us the clothing. He makes everything for us. He's allowed to, us to be in this world. And that's why we remember him. We can't hug Allah like we do to our auntie. We can't, you know, uh, thank them. Well, we can, but, you know, we can't hug them and so on. So that's, we pray. That's how he likes us to connect with him. And if we don't, he's going to be sad with us. And then that means that we're being ungrateful. Aren't we being ungrateful to the auntie if we don't meet her? And she gives us all of that good stuff, all of the candy and everything. Yeah. So we need to get our children to start operating on a love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that needs to be taught organically. What do I mean? For example, when we're eating, when we're eating, and is good food. How often do we get good food on our dastarkhan in a week? Every day, right? Well, at least five out of seven days, right? If not every day. Every time you got good food and it's always good food, you know, alhamdulillah, look what Allah has given us. Amazing how Allah gives us this. Those guys, they don't get any. Those guys are suffering. Look what Allah gives in day, as day, day in and day out. Our children pick that up. That shukran. That gratitude, they'll pick it up because we're being grateful. You don't have to push it on them. Let them see it in action. Let them see us being grateful because we got so much to be grateful for. They get a new set of clothes. Thank Allah. Look what Allah has given us. He's made it so easy for us. Just thank Allah and make that easy. A, a, a guy that I know, his father just died. He's an older guy. His father just died. And he wrote um, a obituary to his father. And something really interesting his father used to do that really touched me a lot. He said that my father, whenever there was something that he couldn't do or my mom couldn't do or none of us could do, he would, and, you know, uh, he would be part of that discourse. He would say, look, I can't do anything for you, but you know what? Allah can. We can't do anything for you, but you know what? Allah can. That would be a constant slogan, constant idea, constant advice. So the children are going to ask Allah. And Allah then provides. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was Imam in California, we used to teach, when I was Imam in California, I used to teach the older, it was a small community. I would teach the older uh, students and my wife would teach the younger ones. And then what, would, uh, what happened once is that there were a seven and an eight year old, uh, two brothers that joined in, not from you know, an early age, but seven or eight, they're a Muslim family, but they just joined in the maktab. So, what happened is, my wife was teaching about Allah that day. Description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is the greatest. He is the most powerful. Nobody can stand in front of him. He can do whatever he wants. Suddenly one of those kids suddenly shouts out, Power Rangers. Suddenly, because when they heard about these, this invincible force, these great powerful individual they thought he was talking about power rangers because power rangers for them was the strongest force in the world can you believe that they were seven or eight seven and eight around that one of them said it. i can't remember which one on the other hand you've got a two three or four year old they've gone to the ocean huge pacific ocean the waves are just coming at you nobody asked this kid anything and this kid just suddenly says Allah made this. He just couldn't help it. He just had to voice that out. Allah made this. Why would he say something like that? Because they've been, and that's where the stories of the prophets and the Sahaba come in. That from a young age, if you're reading to them and you're telling them about the power of Allah through his prophets, right? In the stories of his prophets and companions, عنهم, they will imbibe that and understand that the strongest force is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is who they're gonna. So now uh, another another incident. So 
this time we've got a seven-year-old girl. Okay, we've got a seven-year-old girl. And her older brother, two, three years older, had to go to the optician. And it turned out that he needs glasses because he's got some eyesight issues. So when he came home, the sister found out, she started making fun of him, saying that you're going to have glasses. I just, you know, brotherly, sisterly uh, banter. The mother said to this girl, she said, uh, don't make fun of him because your mum has glasses, your dad has glasses, your older brother has glasses, so you're going to get glasses as well. You're probably going to get glasses, so stop making fun of him, just to stop her. Then nothing more was said. He was seven years old, right? Ten years later, she's got younger siblings, and they need glasses as well. Everybody in that family needs glasses except that girl. Ten years later, how old is she? I was waiting for Orwa to figure it out. Man, where's your maths gone? 17, 7 plus 10. She's 17 years old now. This is some, some discussion came up. She suddenly relates that, you know, mum, when you told me when my brother had uh, got glasses and I was making fun of him and you said, you're going to get glasses as well. I started making dua to Allah that I don't want glasses. And it worked. Allah works. And now, just imagine the ma'rifa, the, the knowledge of this girl, that if that worked for her, Allah work, has worked in other places because she's constantly resorted to him. Now, where did she get that from? I mean, at that point, when she was seven, the mom should have said, say to, I can't do anything but, you know, tell Allah not to give you. She didn't think of saying that to her. At that time, she just said, don't make fun of your brother. But clearly, they had tarbiyat in that house, which means nurture to ask Allah. So she thought, you know what? I can only ask Allah, let me ask Him. Without telling anybody else, just her and Allah, and Allah helped her out. But we're going to have to encourage our children to do that. We're going to have to do that. Like whenever we're in some t difficulty and we ask Allah, and then oh, Allah Ta'ala helped us. So many of us appreciate Allah. We believe in Allah. But we don't voice it out in that way that our children pick it up. That's pure tarbiyat. That is the nurture. They need to pick this up. And now, as I said, if we pick this up, if our children pick this up, half of our job is done. If our children can start doing things for Allah, there's still going to be musti, as they say. There's still going to be some mischief. And innocent mischief is completely fine. I go to certain people's house and they say, this kid, bara musti khore. Like, he's really mischievous. I don't, I actually feel that this kid is going to become something good because a lot of mischievous children, right, have, be, have you know, have been able to do something because they, it, it's a, don't write people off. Don't write, evil is a problem. And evil is something different. Like in shaitaniyat, that, you know, that's a problem. But normal mischief, they, they're just a bit bolder. That's what they are. Allah, that's a talent Allah has given them. It just needs to be challenged in the right way. Yes, it's a bit more trouble. It's a bit more difficulty. It's a, a bit more sabr you have to do, but it's all good. Inshallah, it's all good. That's what it is. Allah, one thing you have to remember is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates every single individual in this world with two packages of things. One is a package of qualities. And the other one is a package of weaknesses. Everybody. Because nobody's perfect, right? And what's interesting is that you got three or four brothers and sisters, same mother, father, same food, same tarbiyah, everything. But they all have different packages. Yes, yeah, some things will be similar, but they all have different. So you'll have one of them which is sharper than the other. You'll have one of the kids, they're more generous than the other. You'll have one kid who's a bit more stingier than the other. Some kids will share their last candy and someone else will not. Someone will be lazier. Somebody will be go get it five minutes early. Some will be not prepared even after the time. Right? We, we can think of ourselves how we are, right? So ultimately, our job as parents is to help our children determine their qualities so they can use them. Most people in the world do figure out that anybody who thinks they're successful to a certain degree, they figured out their qualities. Otherwise, only losers don't, who are still stumbling around. They're losers, right? But otherwise, Allah has given them, they just haven't figured it out. But most people or many people don't figure out their 
weaknesses and don't do anything about it. They deal with it, they stumble upon it, and they constantly have issues with it, like anger problems, uh, too much desire, too much greed, um, hatred, jealousy, these are, all, these are all issues, right? But we need to tell our children and find out, figure out what their qualities are, what their weaknesses are, and in a way, in a wise way, allow them to control the second and harness and use the first. So what I want from everybody today, especially our children, but everybody else, is just think of three of the qualities Allah has given you. And then think of three of the weaknesses that we have. And then do something about it. Uh, how many of us have thought about the weaknesses they have? Right? How many of us have thought about it? We've stumbled across it when we get too angry. It's like, oh, I've got an, but I've got an anger problem. I am stingy. I have too much desire. You know, I have too much. I'm, I jump to conclusions too much. Like face it, then we can do something about it. I moved on to something else here, but with our children, it's our responsibility to do that with them as well. So there you go. That is, let us outsource it to Allah by making the whole love of Allah aspect organically uh, 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 part of the tarbiya at home so that they pick it up, they pray for Allah. Yes, they need encouragement, they need reminders. We're going to have to give that. But we can only do that if we're reinforcing that ourselves and showing that ourselves. So it has, it has to start from us because we're the best role models and everything outside is going to be filtered in the home. So that's, uh, that's essentially what I want to say today. And uh, let's open it up to questions, if there's time. Yes. I don't have an answer to that. I can give you certain suggestions, but there's, I don't think anybody has a proper answer. If somebody does, please let me know of how to deal with the social media problem for our children. Uh, forget children, for the adults. It's such an issue, right? There's one kid, he goes to a school which pride themselves on being paperless, which means they give everybody an iPad. Then they call home and say, your child is sleeping in class and is not, well, it's your fault because you're giving him this iPad. We don't give them anything. And it's your iPad that's causing all these problems. Plus, the iPad you give, you can't even put parental controls on them because they can't add anything. But he's got YouTube, mashallah, you know. It, it's an issue. What I would say is that some of the strategies, and again, in, in, we have to make a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just tell our children from a young age that, look, you're going to get a cell phone at 16. I know everybody else has it, but these are the issues. And I tell you, a lot of children do know the problems, especially if they're addicted. But it's a difficult one. So sometimes they don't want to listen to us. They just think we're haters. You just don't want me to play. Get them something else that is more public, you know, like a PlayStation that everybody can see. So they got some alternatives that are, uh, you know, that are more controllable, you could say. Because these little devices, they're, they're just very dangerous. So number one, you make that from before, you're only going to get it when you're 16, for example, or when you go to high school or something like that. That's number one. Number two, if they don't listen to us because we're biased, and we are biased, but we're right, uh, let them listen to some documentaries. If you go onto YouTube, and there's documentaries by experts in this field to show you how addictive and harmful social media is. So you tell them to listen to another source from the same source that they, you know, that they're looking at Mr. Beast from, right? That's another way to do it and just make lots of dua to Allah and just, I'll tell you something, when it comes to, you know, we were talking about the younger, if we start with the teenage, uh, number one, you can't win every battle. You just pick the battles because if you try to win every battle, you might end up breaking the whole thing. 
Muawiyah radiallahu anhu had this amazing way of dealing with the various different factions that existed in the ummah at that time after they had just gone through huge chaos after the, towards the end of um, uh, Uthman radiallahu's time and during Ali radiallahu's time and so on and then how did he bring peace and reconciliation and some kind of you know uh, some kind of harmony he said that i have a relationship like a tug of war right between all the groups and the tug of war is with a hair strand a strand of hair not a rope which means it's very delicate they pull i have to sometimes let go but if they start pulling too much i have to then pull back but trying not to break that so that's what we have to do every family situation is going to be different we just have to do the best that we can okay and uh, we just make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy Again, I don't have a perfect answer. I don't think there's any magic to it. Get more involved. So he's gaining that trust. So mashallah, well, the brother is explaining his anecdotal story of his, his own daughter that she was into this Korean music stuff 24-7, etc., etc. Taylor Swift, he mentioned or something like that. She gets a mention in the masjid, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, right? Um, anyway, so he just got closer to her, right? Not to Taylor Swift, to his daughter, right? And so the trust was built up. I was just in Scotland and one of the Maulanas there, he knew every, every place to go and see something. The waterfalls, the nice walks. It's like, how do you know all of this stuff? He said, Karna parta. Otherwise, ye log bas wo phone pe bethe rete. Right? Basically said that we have to do this. It's our investment. Because if you do these more funner things as such, then ultimately they don't have time for that. Uh, just now, we went to Scotland for five days. And I had taken my son's phone the day before I just taken it away, right? He's 17 years old. I just say, look, you don't need it. Just do something else for now, right? We had Mehman as well. And I put it somewhere. I thought he knew anyway. And then we got on, uh, got out the house on the train. And he's like, where's my phone? I said, I thought you took it. Because I said, you can take it with you. He goes, no, I thought you were going to bring it. I said, man, I thought you knew. Alhamdulillah, he didn't have it. We has had fun, right? I didn't do that, you know, on purpose. It was by accident. But I think we have to show that there's other things, and I think we don't have time. There's, it's all become in the home, so that's 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 become a big issue. Okay, other questions here. Well, that's if you like uh, make that an aqi, the point that Allah will be sad with you, never be happy with you, then he might tra traumatize him in the, in the future. But no, these are uh, just developmental stages. And then after that, you teach them. With the, it's the carrot and st uh, stick approach. Allah uses it with us. Do you know why, do you know why uh, the real people who know Allah want to go to paradise? Not for paradise. But it's the place that you can see Allah. That's why they want to go there. So paradise is no longer an issue. For them, it's really, I just want to be with Allah, and that's the place to be, that's why I want to go there. So even paradise is a carrot, and hellfire is a stick. So we, we, it uses that with us as well. 
Otherwise, ultimately, when the people of Allah don't care about anything, they just want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's completely fine to use a bit of that psychology at the beginning. Right? And then that's how we train. That's how humans train things. The other thing I want to bring up is uh, older children. I mean, I know this is not comprehensive, but older children, a lot of us are focused uh, on uh, a bit more tarbiyat sometimes on the girls more than the sons. And they become nearly of marital age or over, seven, uh, over 18, for example. And they don't know how to welcome a guest in the house. A guest will come, the parents aren't there, right? And the guy will like, mm. he's like grunting. He doesn't know how to say, Asalaamu Alaikum Uncle, how are you? Sorry, my father isn't here. Is there something I can do? You know, what, what can I do for you? They're like, yeah, mm, you know, it's just one of those things. So we need to teach, uh, a lot of focus goes on what to teach the girls, right? So I want to remind the girls as well that, you know, I see in a lot of these profiles, she likes baking. You know, in these marriage profiles, she likes baking. Like, what about cooking? Like, okay, baking, tikka, that's extra, man. But do you know how to cook biryani? Do you know how to cook 10 of your dishes? So I might told my daughter, you're getting married, you better know 10 of your dishes. Right, otherwise that's embarrassing. One girl, she says that I got one friend, her husband cooks. He likes cooking. Another one, her mother-in-law cooks. And the third one, I don't know what it was. I said, um, you think that you're going to be lucky to get one of those? Like, is that what you're hoping for? And learn to cook. And the guys, they don't know how to tighten a screw. Something's, you know, something just needs, they don't know how to tighten a screw. They don't know how to pay a bill. They don't know how to make their bed. And some people discriminate against their daughters why, uh, and even though they're pushing them into university and wanting them to be successful, they still have to do all this other stuff where the, the guys, they get to relax and uh, you know I don't know how much more time we have but there was an alima she's teaching an alima class of 17 to 22 year olds and suddenly the, a discussion came up and the girls are saying majority of the girls are saying we don't want to get married okay why not because of feminism that I've got a career it wasn't that this time what was it we don't like men Men are bad. They said certain words. One of the girls said, I would never marry a man who's on social media. Are you on social media? Yes, I am, but I'm getting off. They just know what's going on. We don't want to marry. Men are just bad. How do you men feel about that? If girls around ages of 20 are saying that they men are all idiots, Right, and they don't want to marry any men. How do you feel about that? I mean, you better feel bad because you're not going to find girls, right? Why though? One of the one of the girls, the teacher started talking to one of the girls and said, because it was shocking. Okay, you've seen men on social media, but don't you have a man at home that can? Bring back your iman in men. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Bring back faith in men. Then you have a brother, a father. So she said, my father has been beating up my mother since as far as I can remember. And she just thinks all men are like that. She doesn't want to marry men. We're not giving them. And you know, I, I, I know this is not everywhere necessarily, but <clears throat> be a man in such a way that your sister feels that that's the kind of husband she wants. And likewise, be girls for the sisters that your brothers would like somebody with your character. Be that kind of a role model. And it's our parents' responsibility to make them like that. So it all comes back to the parents. Okay, I don't know, how much more time do we have? Or is the time up? Yes. And if the sisters, I mean, uh, any tertib for the sisters to have questions if they want? If they have a piece of paper and throw it down, something? Yep. What's the opinion on allowing children to go out for dinners? Uh, how old are they? Okay, if there's a kid who's 17 years old and he wants, like my kid, he's 17, he studies in an alim class, most of the other students are his age or a bit older, and sometimes when they're finished, they want to go and quickly eat something, I can trust that I let him go sometimes. 
it depends on who they're going with. If you already know who your, teen, your, your, your child's friends are, then you know whether you can call out. Now, you're not going to let them go all the time, but sometimes you're going to allow them. All their friends are going, they're not going to go. And there's one guy I know, he lets his daughter do whatever, but he's always 10 steps behind. I'm not going to encroach on your privacy, but I'll be, we're going to go to the mall. I'm going to be 10 steps behind. You can go with your friends. Still might sound a bit weird, but he's like, I've seen it all. He's a taxi driver. He said, I've seen it all. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up with my daughter. That's different approaches. I can't do that, but I've tried to find out who her friends are. And then I have decided based on that. So there's never one answer to anything. It just depends on the situation. Okay, Jazakallah khairan. Our time is up. Allah bless us all. Allah Ta'ala give us proper tarbiyat. Allah help us and assist us and be successful in this regard. I've got a number of other uh, talks on this topic on my channel, Zamzam Academy. So check that out, both on marriage and on bringing up children. Right, and I'm hoping to inshallah now write a book on that subject. Uh, soon inshallah make dua for that as well. But yeah, check it up on Zamzam on the website or on the channel. And inshallah keep us in your duas. May Allah bless everybody's children, protect us. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah.